Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday, Monday Mindset, Mindset Podcast. Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 146. And this week, it's Daisy's turn to share something with us. Daisy, what do you have? Well, Terry, I don't have much of anything. <laughs> Yes. Well, I do and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I have been uh, exceedingly busy, as you know, just, oh, you're busy too, but um, pulled in different ways, been doing lots of DIY and editing and have just discovered there are only so many things I can do in a day. It seems that I can only focus on one thing at a time. I'm, I don't know. I'm going to blame it on the menopause. I like to blame everything on the menopause. So I've decided we should have, I'm not sure what we're going to call it, wild card, pull the joker card, whatever it is, those weeks <laughs> where we meet up and we have failed to prepare anything specific. And so we just have to talk off the cuff about things that we've been listening to that we find interesting, but that aren't necessarily completely relevant to this podcast you will find this easier because you could talk off the cuff. In fact, I think you've done it before in one of our official episodes of one of the many books that you like to talk about in your work or just something pulled out of your head that's useful, of which it is full of such things. But the funny thing is, Daisy, this is actually like the genesis of this podcast is that well, you yes. and I would talk and just <laughs> pull things out of a hat and discuss. And now... It's like, hmm, let's just talk about something I've listened to once upon a time rather than I prepared this one for this week. <laughs> so I listened to an extraordinary amount of stuff, um, especially, well, you imagine, I was just telling you before we started recording that I have spent hours upon hours painting. Ceiling took over three hours. Walls took over five hours. People are wondering why it takes so long. It's because I am obsessive about the finish of my painting and I refuse to use rollers because I hate the sort of stipple finish. So I do it all with a paintbrush. Um, so it ends up taking four bloody ever. Um, but the upside of that is I listen to lots and lots of audio books, which I can't really do when I'm doing noisier things like sanding the floor, which is something that I've also been doing this week. But when it's things like painting and, and staining the floor and stuff, yes, perfect. And of course, I've mentioned before, every time I'm walking the dogs or all the other things, I'm washing up, I'm always plugged into an audiobook. So I get through a lot. And a lot of that is uh, trashy, detective, crime, thriller type fiction. But I do intersperse some non-fiction and I have cycled a couple of those things in lately. I always get reminded when it's Black History Month. I don't know, is, is Black History Month everywhere or is that just in the UK? I'm not sure. We have one. I don't know if it's the same one. Yes, that's what I meant is do we have it in the same month? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But I get reminded about some of the books that I've got in my library that I haven't got around to reading yet. So I decided to pull them out. One of those was entitled Black and British by David Olasoga. And this is what I would call a bit of a, um, it's a very weighty tome. It's long. It's, it's a bit of a dry text. It reminds me of your sort of school history textbook. In fact, it absolutely should be on the school curriculum. It's one of those sort of textbooks. I very much doubt it is, but it should be. And it's one of the reasons why I like, I mean, you know, I'm interested in the topic, but I also feel a certain sort of sense of responsibility to try and fill the many holes in my history education at school. Because, of course, they, d they don't talk about these things. I mean, I don't remember from my days learning history at school, them talking about slavery. <laughs> but they bloody well should have done because our um, country was built upon it. But there you go. So I kind of, you know, two sides to it. Feel, uh, you know, I'm interested in it, but I feel a responsibility to fill those holes lacking in my education. So it's it's very good. It's very interesting. But I... 
got a fair a, a fair way in and then put it aside we'll go back to it because it was just a bit too heavy going i then switched to another text called the windrush betrayal by amelia gentleman and she is a journalist for the guardian and this was a really interesting book and it's something that i realized actually about the style of writing that i find engaging now the one i just mentioned by david olasoga is very much a sort of history textbook but amelia's book is told much more through personal stories so she starts it with the story of a woman of course i can't remember her name Mm, pauline paulette i think it might be paulette her story her windrush betrayal story and she also weaves her own story into it and and the things that happened to her as she was writing these various stories for the guardian um and uh interestingly she's married to a conservative mp which must get complicated sometimes so she writes for a pretty left wing newspaper and her husband is a conservative mp so obviously right wing but she she focused quite a lot on amber rudd who was our local mp and but also was the Home Secretary. And she actually brought about, or the Guardian and articles, brought about Amber Rudd's downfall, her resignation. So that was really super interesting. But the style, this telling through personal stories, I find a lot more engaging. So the structure of the book are personal stories. And through that is weaved the historical text. And so that's just something I realized about how I react to, you know, different styles of writing with books, but both very interesting. Then I've also been listening to, and I'm part way through this, what I quite often do with nonfiction is that, especially if they're long ones, is that I'll listen to a big chunk of it and then I'll go and do some fiction and then I'll come back to it. And this is what I've been doing with a book called The Snakehead which is by Patrick Radden Keel. I've read two of his books already, one on Northern Ireland called Say Nothing and another one uh, called Empire of Pain, which is about the Sackler family and all about Oxycontin, which was really fascinating. But this one, The Snakehead, is all about Chinese, predominantly anyway, Chinese people smuggling and one particular kingpin or queen pin I guess I should say called Sister Ping and she's a very unassuming middle-aged grandmother running a multi-million empire or at least she was out of a tiny noodle shop in New York's Chinatown so it's all about her story and again weaving the history around it and it's fascinating you know it gets into triads and and all sorts of things and talking about the general topic and subject of immigration, which I always find quite interesting. So weaving some of the history of the laws of immigration in America. So so that's been very interesting. So two or three nonfiction books there. Um, and I've just started a very long and feels a bit weightier every now and then with my fiction. I pick something that feels a bit more, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but I suppose, like I was saying, that the things that I get through at a rate of knots is more what I'd sort of, it's not really trashy fiction, but you know the kind of thing. We've we've shared a series or two of books, haven't we? Like the, mm-hmm. the uh, canine detective and things like that. So they're very, they're just very quick romps through. But sometimes I read a sort of a a bit more weightier fiction. And this one is called To Paradise by Hanya Yanagihara. And it's one of these ones that spans the decades or the centuries even. And it's quite interesting. It starts with an alternate version of 1893 America, in which there are these free states, which I think was um, New York... Massachusetts and one or two others. I can't remember. So that sort of area. 
And the predominant theme of these free states was that people could love and be with and marry whomever they wanted to. So you imagine if you're going back to, you know, 1893, obviously there was no such thing as same-sex marriage, but this is one of the things that they built the free states upon. But there's some quite interesting questions. So the character in it, for example, is he's in this first section, is torn between you can marry whomever you like legitimately from a sexual orientation point of view, but not from a class and money point of view. So the man that he falls in love with and wants to be with is not of the right class and is not of the right financial background. So although they have this freedom to be together in one sense, they're restricted in another sense. And he asks him to run away with him to the West Coast where things are not so free or they're more free on one side, but not on the other. So they could be together from a class and financial point of view, but they can't be together from a sexual orientation point of view. So over on that side, on the West Coast, it's illegal. So, you know, quite interesting. So it's very much an interpersonal thing. It's all about relationships. It's about these different structures. And then also talking about some of these sort of bigger questions and topics. I won't tell you what decision he made, but We've just jumped to 1993 and then the third part of the book jumps to 2093 and they all link in some way. It's one of those sort of books that stretches and it's a, it's a great long book. It's like 26 hours or something. So that's going to take me a while to get through that. But it feels it's a weightier text, if you know what I mean, on the novel's spectrum. I give you credit for a withstanding 26 hours of listening. Of course, I, <laughs> I speed mine up so that they go a lot faster than they're actually recorded. But 26 hours that I, I sometimes look at a 10 hour book and think, oh man, how am I going to get through that? But whew, I don't think I could do one that long, Daisy. See, I can sometimes get through a novel in a day. I mean, not a obviously a 26 hour one because I'm not like you I don't read it at double the speed I've I've heard Terry listening to <laughs> things in it they talk really fast they go like this and it's really 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 fast but do, do you listen to fiction like that as well yes not quite so really? fast mm. it really depends um lately I've been listening to some fiction that's recorded um the book I'm listening to right now is set in Ireland and so the accent for me, I have to go a little bit slower. Otherwise, I, right, I don't yeah, understand yeah. the words. So I, I definitely have to take some books slower. It also depends on just why I'm listening to it. Mm. If I'm listening to it, for example, if it's something that I'm pretty familiar with, like a book about, I don't know, stress, and I want to get it done before I'm going to do a presentation on stress, I may listen to it more quickly. Yeah. Um, but if it's something that, you know, I don't know, there are just some things that have to go a little slower, but I, I can hardly listen to anything at normal speed because it seems like people talk very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's funny, isn't it? And some of it does come down to the narration. I must admit, I'll quite often certainly go to 1.1. That doesn't make a huge amount of difference. But sometimes the narration is so slow that it needs speeding up. But I find anything much more than that, and it sort of distorts the, the voice, really. And I guess maybe just because it's part of what I do with the editing, I can't bear that kind of that distortion, whereas just speeding it up from 1 to 1.1 hardly makes much of a difference unless they're speaking quite quickly to start with. So I do sometimes do that. But for the most part, I listen to things as they are. And yes, I, I don't know how you do it sped up because I just, I tend to zone out a little bit anyway. So if it's sped up, I would just miss the whole thing. <laughs> but the other book that's still playing on my mind is the Everyday Sexism book. And it's one of the things I meant to bring up, actually, in the, there were lots of things that I meant to talk about that I completely forgot. And of course, remembered afterwards. It's like that, isn't it? When you've always had that, an argument with somebody and say, like, yeah, yeah, you think about it afterwards. That's what I should have said. Uh, it's a bit the same with recording. Things I forgot. 
But one of the things she talks about with everyday sexism is with women getting older and the invisibility that often comes with that. For some reason, this was turning over in my mind earlier today. And I was thinking about, I think I've shared on this podcast, but I've definitely shared with you. In a way, it reminds me age and fat create that same kind of barrier. I I just sort of got to thinking, if you remember, I talked about when I lost weight, I suddenly realized I felt really vulnerable. I'd lost that literal barrier of fat that I hid behind that, that gave me a certain amount of invisibility. And I think anyone who's been extremely overweight will will know what I mean. In some ways, you're more visible, but in a lot of ways, you're. I say certainly, certainly is not really the right word, but certainly for me anyway, felt less visible from a sexual point of view, which I think is, is what mattered in that case. There's an overlap, I think, with the invisibility that comes with age, with probably with men and women, but I think particularly with women. And I've got my I've got my notes here. Age equals invisibility. And then I've got another fat and invisibility. And I'm sort of talking quite a literal sense when I use that word. You know, I think of it as my layer of fat, my armor of fat. I'm not using it as an adjective fat person. I'm talking about the actual fat. Um, And then I've got sort of, I've got comfort zone. And I've realized that I've kind of slid back into what feels a bit more comfortable for me as I've got a bit older, feeling got that nice sort of little bit of cloak of invisibility again. I'm not sure whether that's healthy or not. But it also keeps coming to my mind. I tell you why it keeps coming to my mind is because of my I mean, Facebook feed where you get this. It was just this morning, a picture of Helen Mirren looking fantastic. I think she donned, I'm not sure why exactly, I think there was a reason for her having some hair extensions. She's sort of known for having um, a very lovely cut actually, but quite a short haircut, very stylish. And she turned up at the Oscars or something with wonderful long hair. She'd had some hair extensions and whether it was just for this do or for some part or something, I'm not sure, but long flowing locks. Loads of criticism. Women her age shouldn't have long hair. You can imagine how much that enrages me. And her, she's, well, F you. I'm going to keep it for a while now. I'm not going to go back to my short hair. But it just got me thinking about women in the spotlight who age and who maybe think that it's important. And I'm going to put that in quotation marks is an important part of their career. And it made me think of women like Madonna, for example, who gets criticised every time. I mean, she's always been criticised every time she's changed her appearance from when she was very young. But she's she's had a lot of criticism of late. And I think a lot of um, pop stars, actors, as they age, who feel it feel the necessity to stay looking younger and have plastic surgery... And they get criticized for that. You get the whole, oh, they should age gracefully. But if they don't do it, if they do age gracefully, then how much are they losing the visibility that they need? So how much, you know, it's chicken and egg, isn't it? Which which is driving which? So it, it just, there are these things, like I say, that pop up in my feed or pop up in my mind or discussions that come up that just keep bringing this everyday sexism bubbling back up to the surface and it just enrages me that the different the different pictures that pop up on the feed whether it's I can't remember the name of the pop star but she's quite overweight and was I thought she looked fantastic actually but wearing very striking revealing semi-see-through and performing on the stage. And of course, she got criticized. She shouldn't be wearing that. She's overweight. Jessie J was another one just the other day. Very, very pregnant. Was performing. I'm not sure where she was performing. She's a pop singer. Again, she looked sensational. She was wearing what looked like quite 
plain and not particularly skimpy, actually, um, black bikini under a long sort of sequined, see-through, glittery, long shirt coat thing. Very, very pregnant. And she had that stance. You know, she she's a powerful singer. And it was just that. It For me, actually, the more I thought about it, the more I found it a very moving and powerful image, this sort of, it just felt this, this raw essence of the power of feminine. This is she's standing there bold and strident and knowing what her voices sound like. I can imagine the voice coming out, but loud and proud with this huge burgeoning pregnant with life. You know, I thought what a powerful image. I'm sure you can imagine. What were the comments? What were the comments? Overriding. You know, how is it disgusting that she should dress like that? Showing, you know, showing her baby bump there for all to see. And it, yeah, I just, sometimes I I just despair. But sometimes when those topics come up and, and I get frustrated like that, Daisy, I have to think back. And I know for some people, this will be enraging as well when I say this, but I really do have to look at how much it has changed and we have so far to come. Mm. But I remember in my early teaching years, my early teaching career, so this would have been in the 1990s, <laughs> um, I remember several teachers talking to me about when they were beginning teachers and got pregnant. And you had to leave school mm. because you wouldn't be seen as a teacher pregnant wow. walking around the school. Mm. And, you know, just the idea that if a male teacher's female partner were pregnant, he, he still works. Mm. He still goes to work every day as a becoming parent. But for a woman in that becoming parent stage, it's somehow sexualized. It's somehow inappropriate. It's whatever. I don't know. It's sending wrong messages to students somehow or something. Um, and so sometimes when I think of that, and then I see a picture that you're talking about, I'm like, holy cow, we have come a long way. Mm. Doesn't mean everyone has, and it doesn't mean everyone is in support of it. But we are making changes. We are moving. And, you know, we're still, you know, fighting, fighting the good fight, I guess. Yes, that's very true. I guess it would be the same across any industry. And maybe mm-hmm. that is what's so shocking to somebody to see I mean you know I don't know I'm hazarding a guess but she I mean she looked very pregnant she looked fit to burst so she's up there performing probably at I don't know maybe eight months pregnant or something that's you know well one it's quite impressive because I should imagine it's quite difficult to be (laughs) doing your normal day job and carrying that around and all the different things that are hormonally going on in your body. Absolutely, you know, not speaking from experience, so I have no idea. But it, to me, it looks like it would feel quite challenging. So kudos for that. But Mm -hmm. but then, yes, on the other hand, like you say, yes, it's an image that is great because it is more the norm now. It's just depressing for me. This, I just, as soon as I saw the image, I thought, wow, you know, powerful, beautiful, but I thought it was fantastic. I should learn whenever there's an image that comes up in my feed <laughs> of a woman looking don't fantastic. Don't read the comments. Don't read the comments. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Unless I guess they're in some kind of suit that's buttoned up to the neck and right down to the ankles and then... No. <laughs> Then there being, you know, there will be some other critical term used to describe how they're too opinionated, too unemotional, too whatever. Um, Just don't read the comments, Daisy, regardless. (laughs) But I think it's quite telling of a book that it keeps repeating on me, a bit like garlic. (laughs) You know what I mean? It just it just keeps bubbling back up some, you know, some things, some things stay with me. Well, especially, I think this is one of those examples. It's bubbling up because this was already an important topic for you. Mm. And that book really, you know, you resonated with those topics and it broadened your connection to it. And now you're thinking of it differently when you think of it. But this was already a topic that, you know, 
two years ago before you even knew of this book, mm. these things would have bothered you. But now you're even more, you know, kind of impassioned about it, having read that book. It was funny how she was she was talking about in that chapter when she was discussing this part about women as they get older become more invisible and you know, a lot of women complain about this. And she, she actually said something like, yeah, that's why you see a, a lot of middle-aged women walking around in, in bright red coats. It's this need to increase visibility because their visibility is going down. But then you get the women who say, well, actually, I quite like it because at least I'm, you know, I'm thankful I'm not getting the cat calls anymore. I'm not getting this. I'm not getting that. And as as soon as she read that bit out, I thought, gosh, yeah, that's that's so true. I am, you know, I feel quite glad I've become less visible because it's put me back into the comfort zone. But then another part of me thought, gosh, how sort of wrong and sad is that in some ways? So I guess this episode is a little bit just the inner churnings <laughs> of Daisy's mind. <laughs> and all you've, over had, the place. <laughs> you've had extra time for churning with all your DIY projects and lots of listening to things to really get you time to think about these things. Yes, that's the thing. That's that's the real, the good part. I'm actually in that part of DIY now. The nice part, the bit where you start, although it's still hard work and it takes a, a long time, but I always get very excited when I get to putting the hard wax on the floor and the paint on the walls. It all starts coming together and looking nice. It's the, it's the fun and the exciting bit. <laughs> Absolutely. And I get to listen to more books. So there you go. Well, thanks for sharing your recent uh, listening to um, reading as we used to <laughs> do. And maybe in an upcoming episode, I'll talk about some of the things I've been listening to when I'm not listening to them on Minnie Mouse speed. <laughs> yes, I think I shared with you the other day. In fact, I think that will be an upcoming episode where I went to, I went to look for the audio book and there was no audio book. I said, nope. <laughs> I have lost the ability to read. <laughs> I have to have it read to me now. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, I know you've got things to do and I, well, I'm not going to get back to my DIY now. It's too late. I'm going to relax and get some sleep, but. Ready for another day of ready DIY. Ready for another. Well, actually, no, I've got to get back to the editing tomorrow, but then I, I will try and race ahead with the editing and get this blooming room finished <laughs> once and for all. And then I've got to start on another one. <laughs> Very good. But until I see you for our next recording. I hope you have, and everyone else at home, of course. Hope you have a very wonderful week. Take good care, Daisy, and I look forward to talking with everyone again soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.